Hello, welcome to Unit 7. This is actually going to be 7A. This is DNA and RNA and their syntheses. And uh, we're going to break this up into more than just uh, A, B, and C. This is going to be Unit 7A1 because A is a relatively long section. I think it's 17 slides, and I'm going to try to use 10 of them. But anyway, what we've got is we've got this spinning DNA molecule. And if you take a look, we've got a left strand and a right strand. And they're um, swirled. This is the double helix of the DNA. And if you take a look at the molecule right there, um, the left strand really doesn't touch the right strand. It's actually hydrogen bond bonded, just like we talked about water, uh, together. And if you also take a look, um, we actually have long DNA and we have short DNA molecules. These are actually going to be... Um, Phosphorus, again, remember we had uh, uh, double phosphate, triple phosphate for ATP, ADP. This is monophosphates. Um, but they make up, these are the nucleic acids that make up DNA. So we actually have um, flip sides, and we'll talk about that also. Um, here we actually have a DNA uh, lab that we are going to work on. This is a student that we had, that I had uh, five or six years ago. And if you take a look, uh, we actually have strawberry material. And in this clear colorless liquid we have up here, um, this is the actual DNA from the strawberry. Strawberry actually has lots of copies of DNA, which makes it relatively easy. We can do the same thing with a banana, but it makes it relatively easy to pull the DNA out and to actually see it. So we're not going to try to do anything other than try to pull out DNA, which you may have done in middle school. This other side over here actually says I share half of my DNA with a banana. The part of the uh, DNA that actually talks about cellular respiration, the part that actually talks about breaking down sugar, the part that talks about growing, um, bananas do the same thing. And the DNA for that section of the banana and that section for us is the same. Um, are we really 99% chimp? Um, I'm going to do this in a different video, or actually probably what I'll do is I'll put the URL below this video. You can take a look at it. And the way we, the way statisticians put things together, we're not really 99% chimp. It's not like we can take a cell out of us and actually flip it around and make a chimp. It's quite different, but it is very similar, just like we're very similar to everything else that's on the planet. It sort of looks like a common ancestor. And then a lot of more um, mutations to make things. Okay, 7A, Scientist DNA Structure and Replication. History. There have been a series of experiments, mostly in the 20th century, that actually proved that DNA was the genetic material for inheritance. You know, we actually knew that uh, males and females or asexual reproduction could give rise to new individuals. And that we knew that there was something inside these cells that actually could make copies, but we didn't know what it was. 1952. Alfred Hershey, Martha Chase did an experiment using a virus that affects E. coli. E. coli is the um, bacteria that actually lives in our uh, intestines, helps us digest food. It's also the things that if we don't clean our hands after using the restroom or if uh, animals drop this E. coli into water and we use that water, um, gets gets the issue with uh, the, the news that we've heard about uh, for lettuce and tomatoes and even in beef. But this is the E. coli bacterium and the DNA, the circular DNA, the protein coats. It's got flagella for moving, and you can see it's very small. Um, we learned that uh, prokaryotic cells are a lot smaller than eukaryotic cells. And this experiment proved the DNA and not the protein coat for the bacteriophage, and we'll have to show that on the next slide, was actually what influenced inheritance. So Chase and Hershey, or Hershey and Chase. So this is what they did. We actually took a bacteriophage, and if you look at those words, bacteria, bacterio actually is from bacteria, and phage actually means to devour. So this uh, virus, in both cases, is going to cause lots of issue to this bacterial cell. So what we did is we actually, or what they did is they put a, sul a phosphoric sulfur, a radioactive sulfur, inside uh, the protein coat of this virus, not the DNA, but the protein coat, and they let this bacteriophage actually go to E. coli and actually inject its DNA, and that's how the virus actually makes more copies. It uses cells, um, takes over cells, and makes this cell create the DNA and the new critters, and then they fell off, 
And after these things were inoculated with the DNA, they put them in a centrifuge, which spun them around very, very, very quickly and actually separated material like the empty shells from the cell. And then when we actually looked at the cell, we didn't find any sulfur inside that cell at all. Did the same thing, so now we put radioactive phosphorus inside the DNA of this uh, virus. We let it go ahead and infect the E. coli again and we let them blend together and then we actually put them in a centrifuge and when we centrifuge we got the bacteria protein coat to separate just like we did here but then when we actually looked at the E. coli we actually noticed that it had radioactive phosphorus in it and it looks like the DNA is actually what's going to be the thing that's going to reproduce this bacteriophage from this E. coli. So they proved that the DNA was actually the inheritance. A little more history. Um, Erwin Cherkoff actually discovers base pairs. If you've all heard about A's and T's and C's and G's, he's the guy that actually figured this out and he actually realized that the ratio was different in species. So this may actually have something different between making a banana and a chimpanzee or a human or a kumquat. And he actually realized that the ad adenine actually um, pairs with thymine, the A's and the T's come together, as well as cytosine and guanine, the C's and the G's come together. So it's an A and a T, or a T and an A, and a C and a, C and a G, and a G or a C. And if you take a look at it, um, we have DNA molecules, or we have the uh, DNA strand, the double helix, actually made of a sugar, which is ribose, um, or deoxyribose in this case. Um, we have a base, and we have a nucleotide, which actually is made by these two things. And the DNA comes together. And we actually have what's called a five strand, five three strand. And that's if it's oriented this way with a five carbon. And we actually label the carbons this way. Five carbon at the top, three carbon at the bottom. And then the other side actually is what's called a three five because to get them this phosphate and this phosphate to match, we actually have to flip one side, and this is now called a 3-5 strand. So we have a 5-3 strand on one side, and we have a 3-5 strand on the other, and then we spin them around, so we actually get that double helix. So here's the 5-3 strand, because it looks normal, and here's the 3-5 strand, because it looks abnormal. And when we actually look at them, one strand is the 5-3, and the other strand is the 3-5. And we'll talk more about that. In fact, you guys will actually make a model of the DNA molecule uh, that actually has this orientation. Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Watkins. Uh, this has to be later in the 1950s. They're actually the first ones to, pick, to get a picture of a DNA. And what they did is they crystallized the DNA, uh, which actually killed whatever DNA it was. And then they take really small uh, slices of it and then actually put it through an x-ray machine and came out with this picture. And if you take a look at this picture, it's got a double helix shape to it because you can see it's focused It's focused really well on there, and then it gets kind of hazy, and then it gets a little better, and then it gets hazy, and it's also got this thing that goes across. And you notice there's really nothing in the center all the way down. And that's where the two sides don't meet. Um, this is the picture that they took. You can see a rusted paper clip. Um, it was folded over inside of there. I actually put this picture on there, but it was basically it was folded over the top and then folded and folded and folded. And this is what's called photo one. So they took quite a few more and they both signed it. And I don't know what this is, but it's type B anyway. And then in 1962, Francis Crick and James Watson, along with Maurice Watkins, actually won a Nobel Prize for uh, medicine. Uh, Franklin actually died uh, in 1958 um, doing these x-rays where she actually took the picture and developed all the pictures and actually did all the slices. Um, she was not given any part of this uh, 1962 Nobel Prize, which I think is probably uh, something that shouldn't have happened. So Watson and Crick, uh, Wat Wilkins and Franklin have pretty much become a historical footnote. Watson and Crick are actually remembered as the fathers of DNA. 
And when they actually, when you see this picture, this is the DNA molecule that they made. So it's got a pipe with pieces sticking out of it and showed the double helix. This is a picture that's very well known with DNA. And then I superimposed that spinning thing to actually show you that it doesn't touch. And theirs do touch, uh, but that's the only way. They can't make it so that it doesn't. Uh, we can do it in terms of a picture. And then um, this is a cartoon where guys actually trying to explain this DNA double helix. And it says, as you can see from this model, the structure is basically uh, a long, uh, twisty, uh, kind of ropey ladder type thingy. Uh, 1953, structure DNA molecule was first described. And you can see that's where we are going to stop for 7A part 1. Thank you for stopping by. Adiós.